I don't know if you're the craziest of all of us. I mean, come on. I'm now. the taxiest. Give me a little bit of a little, little bit of credit here. This week on Backward Compatible. Jam, Doc, and Chris kick off a new series on transitional games with the legacy of Crazy Taxi. Plus, tales from the arcade, including Sky Cursor, Hydro Thunder, and Gauntlet Dark Legacy. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 124 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hello, hello. And today's meaty topic is going to be kicking off a new series that we're working on. Um, name still pending, so you'll get to see that whenever we actually post the episode up. But basically, the idea no, that's of the it, name of the that's a, that's <laughs> name, name, still name still pending. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that we're talking about um, not just retro games, but games that uh, might be considered retro now, but are actually what we tend to think of as sort of that transition period between what we think of as retro and what we think of as modern. Um, and we've kind of defined this through our discussions as something around, you know, 1998, 2002, mm-hmm. um, with a little bit of leniency potentially for like, you know, something that was technically 97, but was sort of like, you know, seminal to creating like this sort of game or this sort of way of doing things that that's what chris wants uh i will execute zero tolerance <laughs> jim is the one picking them anyway so. i'm completely <laughs> apathetic <laughs> it, it's all it's all high school to me so you know i graduated in 94 <laughs> uh so this week we're going to be kicking that off with uh, crazy taxi which some of you might recall was a very popular arcade game uh came out in what was it 98 yes or, no. what was it 98, 98 yeah okay Wow. Yeah, it was also on the Dreamcast, so mm-hmm. many may know it from that. Uh, and so we'll be talking about that game and kind of uh, its place in history and uh, the things that influenced it, the things that it has uh, since influenced. Um, and we'll be talking about the legacy of Crazy Taxi Should on we... gaming. So it actually came out in 1999. 1999. Okay, yeah. cool. Same year as The Matrix. That's true. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. Yeah, that's probably. <laughs> anyway, but let's go ahead and uh, jump into some opening segments, including the button mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, as part of our playing Crazy Taxi, along with multiple other games, we went down to a local arcade, a free play arcade, which we knew had Crazy Taxi. But while we were there, we couldn't help ourselves but play a few other games. And uh, one of the games that kind of uh, drew my eye initially, because I'm a pretty big fan of shoot 'em ups. Um, was one I hadn't seen before or recognized, and it had a very interesting aesthetic. Yeah, I didn't either, and that was a, I don't know, maybe a tip-off? Right, yeah. So it's called Sky Cursor, and it's actually a new arcade game, um, and it's developed by the Sky Cursor dev team, and it's kind of, it's essentially based a lot around um, shooters from the late 90s, early 2000s, um, it my, looks it too. Yeah, it, it, honestly, it looks a lot like Metal Slug. That was the first yeah, thing that yeah, I good inspiration. Right, even though you know Metal Slug uh, is for those that know it's a it's a run and gun type of shooter. Uh, this one is a um, you know space shooter. It's a or ship shooter. Yeah, it's a side scroller. Right, um, same sort of thing that, that Metal Slug is, but you're actually in a ship and you're shooting and, and or you're in a mech and you're shooting. I was in a mech. Yes. I was the dog in the mech. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you let, heard that right. Let's explain that. So here's the story for this game, and that's. One of the reasons why it kind of fits really well within our, our general topic for, for today. Um, the year is 1996. A cataclysmic... Ah, I'll try that again. Easy for you to say. I'll try that again. The year is 1996. A cataclysmic plague descends on Earth. As its infection spreads, hope fades, but you and your dog fight back. Piloting the prophetic weapon Sky Cursor, you take flight to destroy the Necrostar's mutant hordes and save the planet. So essentially, Necrostar. Yeah, that's Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Essentially, the Sky Cursor is a um, a jet, kind of like a variable jet fighter, um, that has both um, a couple different types of attacks. Both has a rapid fire and a shotgun fire, um, and then you also have a melee attack. So the game has three buttons and a joystick. The joystick is for moving up, down, forward, backward. 
um and diagonal diagonal ways as well um up ways back ways slant ways any sort of ways you can think of um and the three buttons are just your attack buttons so you've got one that essentially lets you attack um the other on the far side switches between rapid fire and the more powerful but slower rate of fire which is very a similar to a sh- <laughs> but a lot similar to a shotgun more yeah, powerful good too. for boss fights in the right circumstances right and then the middle button is your melee attack which is very short range but its main benefit is that it can actually um repel projectile attacks like yeah. larger projectiles it can destroy some of them but others it'll actually knock them right back at enemies It's kind of like a spin attack that you don't spin it really is yeah it's like you spin a blade around you mm-hmm. um and there are two characters it's two player and i i strongly recommend playing it two player oh that was a lot of fun yes and uh one of the players you are piloting the sky cursor which is the ship the other actually you are is a um a dog the the the, the dog of the main character i guess i, I don't really know his name what's up dog <laughs> and he's piloting a a giant mech suit which i didn't really look like a dog mech suit but i couldn't really tell that's that's because the dog um inside well I mean, he talks so there is something to that right he, he does talk you know so he, he's quite he's quite domanish in that regard <laughs> and you played the dog uh, i did uh, the dog mecca or the the mecca dog mecca dog yes and how did that what did you think of the game well you know dog? what was interesting about it was uh I, th- I felt like i had a bigger hitbox but i really didn't yeah what i what i actually had was a um a horizontal no that's not right a vertical hitbox whereas yours was a horizontal hitbox and so oh that makes a lot of sense yeah going up and down was a lot easier for me but going left and right was a lot harder and so I, th- I would assume the, the reverse would be for you. Yeah, and so this yeah. idea of having differently shaped, but um, let's call it um, balanced, unequally balanced, if you will, mm-hmm. right? Asymmetrically mm-hmm. balanced um, physical footprints of the characters, I thought was really kind of cool. And of course, it's a 2D space, but um, it, I think, changed just in a simple, simple way uh, how you would play the character as to which one you would prefer. Mm-hmm. Um I just kind of a little bit about the game. So it had um, all the characters that you're fighting are are the enemies that you're fighting. These sort of weird alien demon kind of creatures. Yeah. Very strange aesthetics. Might um, be a doom actually. Yeah, kind but of cartoonish. I could see that. Yeah, like one of them. I know one of the bosses had it was like a giant ghoulish skull, and he had a um, a rocket or a missile lodged into his skull. Yeah, like somebody had shot it at him and it stuck there. Yeah, and he had like he would create all these portals and send trains through them that to was attack so cool. you. Little things like that. And uh, it's only four levels. Yeah, um, which you can play in any order. And then once you play them, yeah, you essentially can replay the game and do loops, which mm-hmm. is uh, pretty popular in, in uh, shmup circles, mm-hmm. where essentially you just try to get a higher score each time. But uh, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it really was. Um, and and there was this, I guess, theme of these demon creature things were going down and they were getting military vehicles and picking them up and that sort of thing. So that, that skull went down and got a big tank at one mm-hmm. point and we were like, Oh gee, he's got a tank. <laughs> and that was kind of fun. So it, it really was, I think, um, aware that games have evolved while still being, uh, sort of retro and, and really bring, bringing back the nostalgia feel. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So we wanted to talk about this game, um, Sky Cursor, because we thought it was so interesting. And yet I went to go look up information about the game and I had actually quite a bit of trouble finding it. So you could find their website pretty easily. It's just skycursor.com. Do you know how to use the Google? Right. And I, and I, I thought I did. Maybe not. So I, I could find the, the website itself, and I could even find a Tumblr page that was seemed dedicated to it. Tumblr um, page, Tumblr yeah. page, yeah. But there's a lot of info. There's a lot of little pictures and GIFs, and it tells you. That's where I read off the story from. Um, no information about the dev team anywhere on the site. I went on their Twitter. I actually was able to find their Twitter page. Not that hard. But it's just called, you know, Sky Cursor Dev Team. And why not? Well, they're the Sky Cursor Dev Team. That's great. But I was I was a little curious about, you know, what their names are, maybe what else they're working on. Do they have a, a, a studio? Or are they working on a bunch of these types of games? So I found they also have a uh, SoundCloud su- uh, page for Blast City Studios, which seems to be the mu- the company or the, the, the team that put together the music for the game, which is actually really good. It was good music, yeah. Yeah, it, it comes across very much as a... Um, well, a, a shmup from the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, so, yeah it, it had that digital sort of poppy 90s vibe, yeah. It had that kind of the Radiant Silver Gun, Ikaruga kind of like, you know, feel to it with like kind of the pumping music, a little bit of um, house music. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Their, their strategy for selling this too seems to be you can't purchase it anywhere except if you want to buy the arcade kit. 
kit itself. Well, that makes sense. Which you can, or you can buy an actual dedicated cabinet that's all decorated with all of their um, artwork and logos and the actual official marquee, you know, et cetera, which is the one that we played on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you could just buy the kit itself for, for less money, but you still have to put it into um, your own arcade. Yeah. You'd have to build a machine. Right. So I, I find that an interesting strategy to when you're selling, when you create a game to sell specifically targeting the arcade market, because it's, it's more old school, I guess you could say. You don't really see that a lot nowadays, right? Normally, yeah, these sort yeah. of games would be sold on Steam and possibly also have an arcade. Well, game. it reminds me of the model in the 80s. Right. Where or it the was 90s. Mail, you know, mail order. Right. Um, well, I was thinking like, you know, 1985, 1986, you, you do software out of oh. your garage. Mm-hmm. And basically, you write off to these companies and, and they would send you the software. And it was like handwritten on a big old floppy disk or 10. And that's the way you got software because it was a hobbyist kind of a thing. And it, it feels to me hobbyist again. It feels like, uh, you know, a small team did a cool thing mm-hmm. and they're sort of mailing it out to interested parties. And that is amazing to me. I love mm-hmm. that renaissance. I, I'm with you. I, I feel that you can you can tell that they're not only fans of these styles of games, mm-hmm. but they're also really big fans of, you know, film and pop culture from that era, from kind of the, the late 80s to like early mid 90s. Oh, yeah. Um, just everything about it. I mean, the game does take place in 1996, even though I think the design is a little bit more 98, 99-ish. Yeah, maybe. Um, but everything else about the game, there's a lot of like sort of Top Gun references, like you and the dog almost have this weird, um, you know, relationship. Yeah. Like your your yeah. your friends, your best buddies. It's kind of you know the you jump up, give each other high five. You're wearing like the um the leather jackets with the, the pop, bomber, bomber jacket, collar. Yeah, yeah the pop <laughs> collar, and so it's 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 got the sunglasses on. It's just there's a lot of like really you know cool stuff in it that um I don't know. I I feel it's 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 a game that's kind of just worth experiencing. It's it's short enough that you can sit there and play it like like you and I did. Yeah. At least play through every level and and beat it um within maybe like fifteen minutes, twenty minutes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, well, it's it's worth, gave it's me some it. fodder for uh, for my next tabletop RPG. So there you go. Awesome. That's that's all that really matters. <laughs> Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. So while Doc and Jim were playing um, Sky Cursor, I decided to revisit a few uh, of the games in the arcade that I sort of recognized. I, I went into this thing kind of like, okay, we're going to play Crazy Taxi. Maybe I'll grab another game or two. But I was kind of surprised. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember playing this game in the arcade when I was younger. Um, and so one that stood out to me in particular that was a lot of fun was Hydro Thunder. You mean Hydro Thunder? Yes. Although, uh, incidentally, we couldn't hear the sound of the games all that well. Really? Um oh. But yeah, anyway, one of the things that really uh, that stood out to me about playing this again is how great the force feedback is on the oh. wheel. Um, and also they kind of create this effect of and I think this is part of the naming um, that want to give you this sense of like, you know, being in this like really powerful, you know, craft. Mm-hmm. And so um, like the seat vibrates and like you kind of have this like sort of vibrating sense throughout the entire thing is kind of that's rumbling boat racing game. Right. Yeah, it is. OK. Yeah. Um, I remember Hydro Thunder, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, fondly. Yeah. Yeah. And so but between the way that they're kind of like rattling you around as you race and uh, the force feedback in the wheel, like you kind of really get the sense that you're piloting this really powerful machine. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was it was just like a really cool thing to experience again. And it kind of reminded me how how um, I think that the arcade format is still valid today in its own way um because oh yeah uh you can get these experiences that you don't get just like playing a console game like you have a little bit of rumble in your controller and that sort of thing and oh my hands are shaking you, you it's can, so lifelike you, you can get surround sound which helps and stuff like that but um there, there's something to be said for sitting down in a chair or with the wheel and like having the thing fight back against you and of course you can get peripherals now mm-hmm. that will have like you know force feedback wheels and stuff but it's kind of expensive yeah that's true. um you, have, you kind of have to be dedicated to that hobby if you will of playing that specific type of game in order for it to like you know to really get yeah, anything you can out sink of it. a lot of money into that for sure yeah and so just going to the arcade and sitting down and being able to have very tailored experiences for each of the games that you try out um i think is a really neat uh thing to do and we'll talk a little bit more about crazy taxi um you know crazy taxi had some good stuff for the 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 wheel for example would sort of go back to neutral on its own so it didn't feel like driving to an extent yeah, spring loaded um but it's not the same as like this hydro thunder sort of thing um another one actually was uh daytona usa which you might recall is like the 1994 uh nascar racing game where you could have like some arcades right, would have like yes. the 40 machines lined up all together and you'd mm-hmm. have like 40 player races 
uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, a whole um, wall, and every, a and, bank of those, and everybody could be in the same race at the same time, which yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that is great. Yeah, it was. That, that, those were always fun, mainly for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, even though, honestly, the the Daytona game itself, I know we, we played that a little bit too. Um, it's a, a little bit repetitive because mm-hmm. you're just kind of going around. It's, it's like it, NASCAR, it's, yeah, so you're just kind of going around in a lap, multiple mm-hmm. laps. Not a, not a whole lot going on yeah. aside from that. But and Hydro Thunder, I think I played one stage that was a circuit with yeah. several laps, but then actually most of the stages I played were um, point A to point B with checkpoints. Oh, cool. Um, which is kind of cool. Um, I didn't get to play this one because they didn't have it, but I'm also reminded of uh, Arctic Thunder, um, mm-hmm. which did that cool thing where they would blow cold air at you and stuff like that. Oh, uh, yeah, to I give you that, that. Give you that little bit of that uh, extra experience. Um, I could have come up, stood up while you were playing Hydro Thunder and just kind of splashed some water on your face if <laughs> yeah. you want to feel more realistic. <laughs> have like a little like fan with some mist to yeah. blow at you or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> maybe maybe like trigger the water to come out whenever you uh, like sort of jump and then splash down again or something. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that, that might be uh, a little bit too much potentially. The maintenance would probably get weird and uh, it would be a bit of a mess. 4D movies. The other thing that kind of struck me about it too is I was reminded of how um, and a lot of those old school racing games uh, at the arcade, it's very, very hard to finish in first. Um, granted, true. I didn't have a lot of rounds to practice, but I felt like I was doing pretty decent and um, like finishing like you know the top third, but nowhere close to first. Right. Um, and I'm not sure like what I could have done differently. And so I almost feel like they kind of um, like, and that's just kind of a thing about arcades is they sometimes like rig the game so to speak to make it really hard for you mm-hmm. to um, to beat it. You know, you keep wanting to right put those quarters in there's so. also heavy rubber banding too mm-hmm. in these as well so even if you start getting out to a decent lead all the other cars are just going to catch up so they're not ever too far behind you mm-hmm. i know they do that i'm sure to increase the tension so it never feels like you're just racing by yourself yeah but the problem there is that if you're really really good then it almost is like you're punished mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's time for war stories tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming Well, you know, uh, while we were down at the arcade, we actually spotted another one, uh, Gauntlet Dark Legacy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was actually really excited about playing this. So was I. We both were. I I was a little bit (laughs) Well, we had to drag Chris over to it. We're like, Chris, we got to play this. It's it's a three-player game. Actually, four-player game. Yeah, could have done four. Although one of the one of the sides seemed to be broken. Yeah, that would have been calling. uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, the reason we're calling this a war story actually is because it was um, kind of disappointing overall. For me, it was disappointing because I was on the end and the screen was cut off. Right. And so I could not right. see my own heads up display um, for my character, especially like during uh, the in-between scenes when you're supposed to spend money and stuff or character selection uh, if you die which happened a couple of times and it was just very frustrating. I ended up playing three different characters throughout and had no intention to do so. And so I lost my XP and other things. Um, and, and I don't know if it was because it was set wrong on, on the CRT screen. I'm not sure how it would have fit into the cabinet otherwise, but it felt like it was supposed to be widescreen and it wasn't. That's what it really felt like to me too. I, everything seemed kind of squished. I know Chris's side was cut off too, mm-hmm. sort of on the edge. I was a little bit in the middle. Um, so yeah, everything felt a little squished together. It was a little hard for us to navigate around some of the uh, slopes in the game that were particularly um, tight because you couldn't really tell. And it was it was very early blocky 3D. This yeah, game was released yeah, it was. in, in you 2000. Could, you could tell when the images were like mapped onto a surface. Yes. That was pretty easy. But Yes, but then sometimes you couldn't tell, okay, am I supposed to walk on this part or um, is it blocked off? And we mm-hmm. had a lot of those experiences where we'd walk up to a wall, think we could walk through it or destroy it, and we couldn't. Um, yeah, we couldn't tell what it was. Right. And the same thing with the enemies, you know, you would get close. You're not, it wasn't quite so clear just how close you had to get to hit them. Um, some of us had range, but the amount of range wasn't very clear. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of, I think a lot of uh, problems with the game. It made it kind of a murky experience. The other part was just the gauntlet design. And this is a classic gauntlet design, by the way, since the very first gauntlet. But you lose health constantly in this game mm-hmm. as you do in the original gauntlet which of course they do that because it's a quarter eater they don't want you to go forever even if you don't get hit they still want you to eventually die unless you're picking up health that's something of a right? timer or too food. it's supposed to keep you moving along sure yeah um and I, I did find out in looking up information about this game is that we actually played a version of the game that included the expansion pack oh interesting so apparently the expansion pack added four extra characters the dwarf knight jester and sorceress huh, i which played two of those some of us played right i think chris you played uh the sorceress at one point right um yeah i did very briefly i also yeah. played the knight for a little while 
Yeah. Um, and I did Jester and Dwarf. Mm-hmm. And I think I stuck mostly to the Valkyrie, um, who's one of the original characters. Mm-hmm. The Warrior's one of the original, so is the um, uh, the Thief. Those three are the, um, not the Valkyrie. The Valkyrie as well was one of the early characters, but from the first game, I believe it was just the Warrior, um, Archer, and uh, Wizard. Classic. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't feel very distinct, though. Like, I, I know that no, they had, oh, like, no, they they had like, different stats, and so, like, one has a more powerful attack, and one attacks a little bit slower, but it's basically, they play the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you have an attack button, which um, both attacks, but also has a, has a slight range to it for every character. Well, there was a speed to their attack that was very different, yes. that yes. I could tell. Yes. Um, but everyone I, had about the same range, I felt. Yeah, yeah the range seemed the same, but the, the power of the hit yeah. was different. So, like, if you could shoot more, uh, each individual hit was less powerful right that's but still it, a conven- standard convention today honestly it, but it also True. just didn't feel like a very meaningful difference like i, no. I could see that being like one of the differences but mm-hmm. then like even like your your magic you don't like have different sorts of magic attacks you just kind of collect one and then you use it and it's based more on the uh, the pickup than it is based on your class or anything like that, that makes sense i had trouble even figuring out the magic system to mm-hmm. be honest with you and maybe it was just because i, I the game got really repetitive and i was losing interest but mm-hmm. You, you just have one magic button that you hit in order to activate your magic. And you have a, you have what looks like a, a health or a magic meter or something at the bottom mm-hmm. of your screen. But even when it's full, sometimes you can't use your magic. So it was really mm-hmm. confusing, like what, how it's supposed to work. And I know we stuck with the game to go all the way to fight the dragon, which took us through several levels um, just because we wanted to experience yeah. it. And... Speaking of the dragon, it was a, a quarter eater big time. I mean, mm-hmm. it just killed us multiple times. You can't even get close to it to use your magic, but I kept trying. I would run up to it. Okay, I've got a full meter. I'm going to hit it to get my magic. Nope, nothing happens. Oh, I get knocked back. Very frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only reason we finished it was because it was on free play. Um, oh, definitely. And That's true. It just, like, I, I don't know. Like, I was bored by the end of the first stage, and we just kind of, like, stuck stuck with it. Um, I found the whole experience to just be, like, this really boring, mm-hmm. clunky grind of a game. and. I- I'll say that as a as a fan of I am a fan of beat 'em ups, um, but I did not like this one. Mm-hmm. I, I do feel that it that it was in that territory of beat 'em up that is just too repetitive. Mm-hmm. And I remember when that game came out, and it was one of the most amazing new experiences ever. It was unlike anything we'd seen before. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting how just in a couple decades we can get so easily bored, um, and we expect the surprises, right? You know, and yet in you know, in something like Sky Cursor, you know, there were surprises and it kept us guessing and it was, it was fun. It was very repetitive, but it was fun because like, oh, what's coming next? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting uh, when you look at it from that perspective, I think. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. Uh, so, Jim, you were one of the first people to kind of uh, come up with this idea. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about um, the thought behind our new sort of transitionary games uh, series here? So the general idea was uh, a lot of people have talked about retro games, old games from, say, um, the early days of the arcade, like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, or uh, the days of the NES or Famicom, where they're even even into the Super Nintendo era with and the Sega Genesis that were very influential, an influential period of gaming where we were figuring out a lot about what are the design principles that work for games. You know, in arcades, one sort of set of principles a lot of times were, were used when you transitioned over to the to the NES, the Nintendo uh, entertainment system. You had to change some of that because you had um, a, you had a, a game that you would pay one lump sum for a large amount of money as opposed to one quarter to play for a short period of time. So the design principles changed. You know, people had to design games differently because the expectation of expectations from the player of what sort of experience they were going to get for their money differed, right? So a lot of people talk about that. They talk about those games and how influential they are, and of course they are, but there's not a lot of a lot of talk about um, what I refer to as sort of a transitional period of games where we're, we've sort of figured out 3D to the point where we know how to do it, right? We've gone through Mario 64 and early th- early 3D games, 3D platformers, 3D action games. So we kind of know what we're doing in that space, but we're moving towards the modern modern game design principles that that you know we all understand just intrinsically after playing so many modern mm-hmm, games. Mm-hmm. Um, we're moving closer to that area, but we're not there yet, right? So how did we get from? It's almost like the missing link, right? How did we get from these these early games 
and the early concept of, oh, here's 3D. Oh, let's figure out how to make the controls work, but we're still using principles from um, the Super Nintendo era or the NES era that we may have perfected, and we're just trying to, like, graft them onto 3D, which I think was a big part of the early 3D era, even after we understood the controls. How do we get from there to the modern understanding of, of, of 3D, um, and not just 3D, but... Um, the expectations that players have for a game experience, how much content they're expecting, and what way is that content presented, what, um, how much story is, is there when it, when it is a game that has story, how does that affect the game, that sort of thing. So it's just sort of uh, what I refer to as a transitional period um, where games are going from the older style of design to a newer style of design. And we've had multiple periods like that in gaming, so this is not the only transitional period. This is just the transitional period that we're choosing to focus on because I feel it's one that... Um, has not been talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. And I define those years from 1998 to 2002, which I feel gives us a, a narrow enough scope to really hone in on these games. We could have widened it by about two years on either side, and it would have been, I feel, just as valid. Um, we could have gone 96 to 2004, and I feel we could have made a lot of the same arguments, but there would be more games to talk about, and I feel like there's still there'd be more overlap. I feel that by focusing in on a smaller region we can really kind of hone in our our topics and we can see what uh how close each of these games are to one another you know it just in design even if they're completely different genres i feel like by the end of this after we do this several times we're going to find uh between them so many different commonalities that maybe we don't even think of right now i'm looking for the innovative thing that thing mm -hmm. which um didn't exist before a particular game but then after that game we sort of see it everywhere yeah um, yeah. I, I kind of look at the whole thing as an interactionist model, meaning um, everybody's kind of looking at everybody. And when one one game does a thing that makes sense and people really latch onto that thing, it may have been the only thing in that game that worked, mm -hmm. but everybody else is kind of like, oh, let's add that to our list of tools to the vocabulary so that after that 10 or so year period, we kind of knew how to make those kinds of games, whatever those kind of games are. And and so today we're going to talk about racing games, kind of, but it's not. Um, it's really a driving game, but it's not. It's kind of like GTA, but it's not. It's Crazy Taxi. Right. Um, and Crazy Taxi was released in 1999, um, and it was it was a game developed by Sega. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also one of the titles on the Dreamcast. In fact, I want to say it was even a launch title on the Dreamcast, uh, but of course it came to the arcades first. A lot of people have that experience with Crazy Taxi on the Dreamcast only, because they may not have seen or yeah. had the opportunity yeah. to play the arcade. Uh, which oh, is, that was me until yeah. I had the chance to play it. Which is a shame, by the way, because I think the arcade is actually great fun. Yeah, it is. The, the whole uh, you know limited force feedback of having a steering wheel, um, actually having gas pedal and a brake pedal, uh, a forward and a reverse, those things were just buttons. And so I found myself um, having to almost relearn it. it. It's interesting. Some of the things from, gosh, it's been almost... 15 years, 20 years um, since I played that game on, on console. Now, 50, it's 15, it's not 20. Uh, but I, I remembered like my old route, um, the optimal route that I had, you know, learned to to play in order to get to the city. Because if you do it right, you can get into the freeway. You can make it down to the downtown area. And that's where it gets really hard because there are no shortcuts. You've got blocks and you're not quite sure where you're going. And, uh, you know, it, it, kind of changes the game a little bit at that point. But um, I, it only took me about two or three games playing in the arcade for those old maps to come back into my head again after 15 years, which is amazing. It was like being in a city I hadn't been in since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with Crazy Taxi, it's it's so much of a artifact of its era. Like so yeah, much. because there's just it, nothing else like it. They not only, not only for the design principles, but I want to talk a little bit about the aesthetics of the game. Not just visual, but, but auditory. The mm -hmm. sounds, too. Because that was such a big part of this game. And it unfortunately, really the arcade that we were at was at free play tends to be pretty loud when it comes to music. And they tend to turn down the arcade machines. So we had a little trouble, or at least I did, hearing the music from the game. Mm -hmm. But uh, for those that recall this period of the late 90s, early 2000s... Um, the soundtrack for, for this game, uh, for Crazy Taxi, was mostly Bad Religion and The Offspring yeah. music. Um, so well-known well -known tracks, but uh, we also have some things from, let's see, we've got All I Want or Way Down the Line from The Offspring, some pretty well-known songs, Hear It from Bad Religion, um, so Them and Us from Bad Religion. So mm -hmm. some pretty well-known songs, well-known bands from that period that 
nowadays, I don't know about you, but I never even think of those bands anymore. That's how they're outside of my my scope they are. And um, in terms of visuals, they have they have things like not not just the way that pe- the characters dress. Like there's four different characters. They all dress just, I mean, like they're all 90s stereotypes. Just oh, yeah. the, like the floral shirts. Um, like, like 90s, like California stereotypes, right, what it yeah. feels like, right? So like the floral shirts and the spiky hair and the, you know, the, um, what's it, like the fisherman cap or whatever that thing it's is. It's very Baz Luhrmann. How about that? Sure. Yeah. You, sure. you know, that, that filmmaker, he's sort of an auteur guy, Romeo and Juliet mm-hmm. made in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, with Leo. With, yeah, with yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio and, and very much a modern, by which I mean nineties take on Romeo plus Juliet. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that aesthetic. Yeah, and it's got tons of product placement as well, but product placement um, specific to, to that hut. period. Yeah, you go to Pizza Hut, you go to uh, KFC, you go to Levi's. Um, yeah. There was um Take me Tower to the Records. original Levi's store, because yeah. that's what you say. <laughs> right, the original Levi's store. <laughs> right. Uh, rights reserved, right next to it, as, right. as they said. <laughs> right. said. Yeah, so little things like that. Um, and of course, the graphics, obviously, of course, are um, from that period, very uh, sharp edges, polygons but because you're typically driving so quickly you don't mm-hmm. really notice that much well, to be fair there are a couple of reasons why that didn't matter back then mm-hmm. and one of them was just tv size sure. you know we hook sure. up these old systems to our new uh 60 inch tvs and it's like wow i don't remember it being this bad yeah and that's because it wasn't oh it's not just that it's also the fact that and this is something i because I play a lot of uh, old games as well, mm-hmm. and there's a big difference between playing a game on a an older game, I should say, on a CRT versus an LCD screen. Absolutely. Because with the old CRTs, the way that they displayed uh, pixels uh, on your screen and the way that they displayed images was a lot different. Yeah. Um, you almost na- had like a natural anti-aliasing. Yeah, you did. You actually, act- you actually exactly did, right. and, and the designers would oftentimes plan around that and they would design their 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 visuals and their sprites to take advantage of those effects so now when you play it on an lcd you're not really playing the way the game was intended to to look you don't know retro you may not you really may not and so in the case of crazy taxi previous reference there uh, to a to last, an earlier, last to, year, earlier yeah. topic yeah <laughs> um but just like in crazy taxi when we go to the art to the arcade which is by the way another great reason to for arcades to exist if it's an authentic machine not a rebuilt one with an lcd monitor but an authentic machine it's gonna have a crt screen like this one had yeah, yeah, a crt so you what you're seeing is it's taking advantage of the um the graphic fidelity of the era as intended yes and it was good Yes, and and it works, and it you, felt right. And yeah. if you go back and play this game on your LCD, which, by the way, I actually did pull my Dreamcast out um, and played this on my LCD screen, nice uh, does not does the graphics do not hold up at all no. uh, in comparison? No, I bet um, not. Speaking of, just before we before we move on from just to the general design uh, in terms of release, Crazy Taxi has also been rolled out as a lot of these older games, older three D games were to um, iOS devices. Yes, which, badly. Yes, exactly. I was going to mention that. Um, the the idea of having a a racing sort of game, I guess you could call it, um, on a mobile device, it just doesn't work. Yeah, in fact, the newest one is um, you don't drive the taxis, you hire the taxis, and then they go off in real time and they do the thing and they bring you back money. Hmm. It's it's not crazy taxi. It's just branded that way. Um, so it's not crazy I, enough. Yeah, right. That's exactly right. Um, well, Doc, you being the crazy mm-hmm. taxi, let's to talk about the design just a little bit yeah. so we can, you know, we'll talk about its place in history and all that in a sec. But you being kind of the expert crazy taxi guy, I think you're the biggest fan here of, of all of oh, us. Right. You're the craziest of all of us. You taxis. are the cra- Well, I don't know if you're the craziest of all of us. I mean, come on. I'm now. the taxiest. Give me a little bit, of, a little, little bit of credit here. But when it comes to crazy taxi, that's all you. So yeah. my, okay. my question is, like, could you talk a little bit about the design? Like, how, how do you play this game? How do you beat it? What's the goal? All right. Um, so you start at the top of the hill, always. Uh, and then the very first thing that you're going to want to do is to go pick up a customer. And there's, let's call it three different colors. Um, there's really a gradient, but you've got green, you've got uh, orange, and you've got red. And the green ones want to go far away and they'll give you lots of bonus time to get there. And the red ones want to get somewhere that's fairly close and they won't give you as much time. But that's the bigger payoff in the end, if you manage to get there. And so really what your strategy is going to be is to make sure that you are always keeping more bonus time than you're spending getting to a place. So, And, and what happens when you run out of time? Well, when you run out of time, it's the game over. Right. Um, you also get extra tips for doing crazy stunts. Mm-hmm. Uh, you actually want to not hit things, uh, though a lot of people play it 
like where they want, they try to hit things, which is actually counterproductive. What you want to do is almost hit things. So you want to like skirt by things and miss it by inches. Um, you want to make jumps. You want to, you know, do that kind of a thing. And, and the crazier it is, the more tips your passenger will give you. And they'll make comments along the way, like, oh man, that was totally nuts. Uh, and that was so cool. And then you start going the other direction. It's like, hey, watch it. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. You know, and, and my favorite is whenever the, like the preacher gets in and you, you don't drive well and he's like, you suck. And then you take me to church and you, you go and yeah. you, you, you knock him out in church. And you're like, that was slow. You're a terrible driver. You know, <laughs> he doesn't tip you. But there, but one of the things about it that's, I think, really fun is it's completely static. It is not procedurally generated in terms of where the pickups are. So you can yes. learn yes. the route. and. Uh, you know, worth mentioning the arcade version and the other versions that were on console, total straight port, absolute straight port. Mm-hmm. The data has never been, you know, changed or updated or, or anything like that. Except for the soundtrack. Yeah. Well, Which there's we can that. talk about later. But... Um, and, and, and I think that that's important mm-hmm. because what it gives you then is, is a different kind of a strategy. And I'm not, I'm not huge on um, memorizing how to beat a game and, and brute forcing it. Um, but I think the playthrough on it being like a three to five minute playthrough, or if you're really, really good, 15 minutes on any individual run, it changes that dynamic. So it's iterative. And I'm glad you mentioned that, that aspect of it, because I think it's so important to its design. It's not a game where you're in one space and you drive around trying to find someone to take them to another area. Actually, what it does is it kind of guides you to the next um, level for lack of a better word, next yeah. area because yeah. um, gated areas, gated areas, will. right? Because you only have so much time to get to each other space. Um, it sort of leads you, assuming that you don't run out of time, mm-hmm. uh, farther and farther away. Like I know you mentioned when you were when you were playing, you got farther than I did, of course. Um, at one point, you got on the on the freeway and you said, yeah. oh, "Oh, I hate this part." And then you end up in a city. And you're like, "Well, I don't remember what where to go in the city." You're in a different area. You got there because the game led you there. And regardless of which passengers you pick up, it will lead you there. Mm -hmm. So it, and I don't know exactly how far the game goes. Is there even a way to beat it? Do you know? Um, Well, if you get an A ranking by getting high enough, then yeah, technically that's uh, kind of a win state. But then there's also a leaderboard. And technically the way that you would uh, beat it is by getting the number one score on the leaderboard. And so it, it's very self-aware that mm-hmm. it is a cabinet game that is meant to be in an arcade right. uh, environment. And and it it works better. And I remember this from the 90s whenever I owned it. Uh, I remember being, you know, trying to beat my own score. And that was interesting. But when I finally did it, it wasn't nearly as gratifying as whenever friends would come over, play it, and they would beat my score. And then I would turn around and beat their score. And I think that there's something to that, uh, the real competitiveness of it. You know, it's kind of like playing Minesweeper. Uh, do people still do that? I don't know. Uh, on and and the only the, all the top scores are your own because it's your computer, right? You know, it's just not as gratifying. So, I think I think that there is something super important to be said about that um, existing in a, a multiplayer space, um, time shifted, and you know. You, nobody, nobody, unless you're coming together as friends and playing like we did, because we did round table. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know who Bob is, but boy, I'm going to beat that guy's score because, ooh, <laughs> you know, and I, I think that that's fundamental to the gameplay. It looks to me like Crazy Taxi, the map is actually a, a circuit. And so it is guiding you along this path. And probably what would happen is if you were doing well enough to actually loop. I remember that. You would sort of just restart. I do and that's how remember that. It and it's worth noting, none of us did this, but you can, as an option, um, whenever the game starts, turn around, like do a 180 and go the other direction on the road. Really? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like doing the circuit backwards, but it works. It actually works. Yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. I was faced one direction. I just assumed. Yeah, you just went the direction the car was facing. Yeah. But yeah. Because they, they breadcrumb you pretty heavily. Like you've do. got like several customers you can choose from right at the right beginning. Uh-huh. And but they just sort of go where It's they almost like you. hard mode if mm. you do it, if you just quickly do a donut and then go back, go down the other end of the, the hill, the other direction. Um, and I remember doing that whenever I owned it back in the day. If I'd thought about it, I would have done it the other day while we were at the arcade. Mm. Um, so I'm going to have to do that next time we go. Well, so let's let's talk about influences for this game yeah um 
we talked a little bit about that this as well while we were playing and shortly after we played sort of a almost like a, a grand theft auto vibe as in the first two grand theft yeah, auto gta games. one and two which was a top down game there was really only one mechanic to that game and that was uh your wanted level you know that that's right. that's what gta one and two were about it was about getting away with stuff and then clearing your wanted level and keeping going and it's almost like that with crazy taxi where instead of a, a wanted level what you have is a timer yeah and that's interesting too because the timer really is like that is the the core um opposition if you will yeah because like there's no like you don't take damage running into things um and it's like it like the pretty idea much is, immortal yeah. yeah yeah uh basically like there's there, there's no other consequences besides just being slowed down but that's uh sort of consequence enough yeah um having those things be in your way that you you don't want to hit them because you don't want to be slowed down they they kind of like it's pretty clear they didn't try to put very much effort into like oh look your car's taking damage over time or well, i'm not sure that like, was even a thing let, let's simulate accidents yeah and that sort of thing you know. i mean gta3 came out when 2001 2002 ish like one or two yeah something like that um I think and, one and and the idea of um hitbox damage on a car was revolutionary well yeah they at least in a somewhat I, I know that they had for example um i believe you could still damage your car and um games like cruising usa couldn't you like kind of mess your car up there were a few on n64 yeah games where you could you could bust your car but you would kind of still drive no mostly head. that was global though yeah and when your car started smoking or whatever the cue was then you knew to get out because your car was damaged yes um gta took a different direction with it and it was like you could you could have all the panels off of your car but if the engine hadn't been messed up once it took enough damage it would start to smoke and then right you know uh, well, let's let's talk about GTA Three then, because I feel like GTA Three, which came after, developed after Crazy Taxi, um, actually took a lot from Crazy Taxi. I think it did. Kind of borrowed a lot of its ideas, and I I, I have this idea that I don't know if this is true, but it, this is this is my head canon here. So stay with me. So I feel that the the designers of Grand Theft Auto Three loved Crazy Taxi, and they would play Crazy Taxi, but they would get annoyed at certain parts of it. You know, they're they're driving along, and there's there's a person on the side. That is, that is annoying them. And they swerve over to run over the person and the person dives out of the way every time. Right. Why can't I hit the person? They knock a car over and the car does a flip and it just sits there. Instead of exploding. Instead of exploding. Yeah. What's going on here? Um, I, I cram into a wall. My car's not really taking damage. What's going on? Right. So and I feel part like. Part of that was they wanted to keep it all ages. Like even the arcade yeah. machine said like, this is a game that's suitable for all ages. Yes. Yes. But also if they had done all that stuff, it wouldn't be the same game. Yeah. Crazy Taxi is meant to be taken, not to be taken seriously. Yeah. It's, it's a very whimsical. whimsical. Yeah. Very lighthearted, whimsical game. So it wouldn't make sense to have your car, your exploding vehicles and you're not, you're running people over. Why? Because. That makes it a very violent game, and it's not meant to be. Mm -hmm, but right. GTA always had that element of, well, you're committing crimes. You're violent. You're going against the cops. Mm -hmm. So it fit better. And so I feel like they, they, they like that idea of um, you're, you're in this vehicle in a 3D space. You're driving around, um, and you can do all these things to your vehicle. You can pull off all these tricks because that had been a big part yeah. of GTA 3 as well. Yeah, they just threw in a whole bunch of different tricks and ramps just into a city just for fun. You can play it. And they even had missions in the early GTA for the, the the GTA games on PS2, which were all designed around the same engine and got progressively more um, modernized and right. refined as they went along from, from 3 to Vice City to San Andreas. They started having missions where you could drive a taxi cab. Yeah, Vice City was actually a game that I 100%ed. Uh, it was like the only GTA game that I 100%ed. And mostly the reason for that was I, I got all the way through the taxi missions. And that was because I had enjoyed Crazy Taxi so much. It reminded me so much of it. I wanted to do that. And you had the timer and the other elements too. Um, but, you know, there were other missions similar to that. There was like the, um, you know, the ambulance missions and the firefighting missions and, you know, the cop missions. And there were even like helicopter missions. And those were the hardest because you couldn't repair the vehicle. Um, so it was, it, that was so much fun to me. And that's one of the, the reasons why I was encouraged to actually 100% that game. But I absolutely agree with your thesis. Um, I, I think that GTA 3 especially was heavily inspired by Crazy Taxi. It had to have been. It just had to have been. Yeah, and I feel that also the um, the Simpsons hit and run, if you remember that game, yeah. it came, came I do, it was yeah. very popular. It came out in 2003 uh, for various systems, PS2, GameCube. And of course it took a lot from Grand Theft Auto 3, but it also yeah. took some from Crazy Taxi. 
It also took some from Crazy Taxi as well, I feel. Well, yeah. And again, you're talking about whimsy. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, the, the, the GTA series has always been comedy, but it's dark comedy. Oh, definitely. So yes. I, I don't- Dark I don't, comedy and satire. Well, black comedy, I would say. Black comedy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, and, and I don't think that, you know, there's plenty to be said for, for satire in The Simpsons, but, but I don't think we would say that, that The Simpsons is dark comedy or that the no. ta- Crazy Taxi was dark comedy. No. That, you know, that, that, that would not be appropriate. And Simpsons, Simpsons tends to err more on the side of, of parody than satire anyway. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, you're not really expected to take it seriously. Um, even if it might have, you know, life lessons to it, you're not meant to, to take everything that's happening um, as though it was presented seriously and yet mm-hmm. uh, satirizing something real. And Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, I think in terms of game mechanics, whenever we talk about what is, to use my own criteria here innovative, Mm -hmm. truly innovative about Crazy Taxi. I I think it was this idea that you're in a car and that you stop and there's a, there's a a target for stopping. Yeah. Um, And it was the go as fast as you can to a specific place and then target where you're going to stop and stop on a dime. Mm -hmm. And if you're really, really good, the drop-offs are pretty big. And if you memorize where the pickups are inside of the drop-off zones, you actually don't have to go pick up another passenger. Right. What you do is you stop at that precise place where the next passenger immediately gets in. And then you have to know sort of internally, okay, is this a passenger I want to take? Because I might accidentally pick up a passenger and I don't want to do that. I want this other passenger across right. the street and it's worth the three seconds I'm going to waste to get across the street for the green instead of the red who jumped in. And and none of it's random. I'm very glad you mentioned that none because- as you were describing that that aspect of the game, um, at least the part where you're you're stopping in one place, you're getting your passenger, and then you must get to the next area and then stop to complete that mission, that reminded me of many of the missions in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, those are many of the missions. You you you're at a place, you stop. There's some story interlude, sure, but when it's done, you get in your car and you have to go to the next part of that mission take to complete me to it, the take me to whatever circle. spot and then stop. And you're in that circle and you stop mm-hmm. and that's how you complete the mission. And I think if you, if you'll excuse me for, for the seemingly random jump here, uh-huh. something like uh, Assassin's Creed uses this core mechanic. Now, whether you have a horse or don't have a horse or you're in a buggy or you don't have a buggy uh, and even some of the later ones, basically uh, like the the Victorian one, you know, you're, you're in a full blown carriage, doing carriage missions and that kind of thing. But, but even in the very, very first one, it was go to a place, get a thing and and don't get caught and then go to another place. And so instead of a timer, what you have is a sort of an awareness meter, that wanted level thing again. So like, if you look at the very first Assassin's Creed, that ties in to GTA mentality. And so I think really what we're talking about, even though we're outside of the car, that, that core innovation is route planning. How are you going to do a thing as efficiently as possible? And, and efficiently might mean time, or it might mean not being seen, or it might mean uh, you know killing everything in an area without ever having the alarms go off. You know how are you going to do this? I did want to point out something to make a slight correction from something I said earlier, um, because there were two Simpsons driving games, and one of them hit and run. The one that I mentioned is actually a little more closer closer to GTA Three. The one I was thinking of was. Road Rage. Oh, Road and Rage. And that one's yeah. almost the same sort of game as Crazy Taxi. So yeah. I, I kind of mixed those two up. I talked did about too, because you were time. talking about it. That's yeah, what I was thinking they're, of. They're both, they both take inspiration from it, but Road Rage is almost a direct Simpsons version of Crazy Taxi. Mm-hmm. So uh, forgive that slight hiccup there. And that brings me to um, another game that I want to talk about that um, I think was highly influenced by Crazy Taxi. And like this just like, it struck me as I was playing Crazy Taxi, like, oh, this is just like Burnout. Um, now I don't know if you guys are familiar with burnout, but, um, it started off as like just a, a more or less straightforward racing series, mm-hmm. um, where you would do circuits and you'd have like, you know, these, these races and stuff like that. Um, and then there was also a sort of secondary mode where, um, because I mentioned how crazy taxi doesn't simulate crashes or anything like that. I think burnout was one of the first games to actually, um, kind of do like to kind of revel in this, um, carnage, if you will, of like you, you wreck something <laughs> and you are, uh, you the body of the vehicle starts to crumple and glass flies out and all this different stuff. Um, and like, you know, part of the game was actually taking down other racers. And so like you could ram them into a wall and then you get to like sort of see them spin out and, uh, crumple and all that different stuff. And so it was like this very kind of like action oriented racer in a way. Um, 
But the other thing that they have in that game is this uh, this boost system. And depending on the type of vehicle, you get different um, like they have different ways of having boosts. So like ones reward you for doing stunts and jumping and that sort of thing. My uh, my experience is mostly with Burnout Paradise. And so I'm speaking mm. mainly from that. But I did play a little bit of the first uh, the first few. How, how new is Burnout Paradise? Uh, I think that was 2008. OK. Um, and Burnout Paradise is actually out of itself quite an influential game that's kind of affected other design. But of course, not in our the period that we're talking about. Um, but what kind of spoke to me in Crazy Taxi that uh, reminded me of Burnout those sort of near misses and kind of the things that give you tips, like right. not crashing, but coming very close to crashing, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, burnout also rewards you for, um, you know, driving on the wrong side of the road, having near misses. Um, sometimes like they'd also reward you for those takeouts and stuff like that, which is of course not something that's in crazy taxi. Um, but it just kind of, I got that vibe of, um, I want to be driving very recklessly cause that's going to give me bonuses. And that same thing co- sort of carried through in burnout. But the other thing, doc, that you mentioned the route planning, um, was something that was uh, featured prominently in uh, Burnout Paradise. Because what they did is they gave you this giant open world map of here's the city they're exploring. And over time, you get to know the city really well. Um, and it sounds to me like um, Crazy Taxi does that same thing in a different way. So what I'd Burnout so, will yeah. do is yeah. basically you drive up to any intersection in the city and it's got an event. And then it's usually it's like drive and there are different sorts of events, but it's always like drive from where you are to this other destination on like one of the eight cardinal points on the map. And so there's basically one of eight finish lines mm-hmm. and you start to get to know very well, um, like, OK, if I'm starting here, I'm going to like take this route down to, say, the freeway, if you like that route. And I'm going to take the freeway from here to there. So it might be longer distance, but you know that you can run it faster because there's less traffic or fewer corners, that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of strategizing about really knowing your environment, knowing where shortcuts are and that sort of thing. Um, when you're playing Crazy Taxi, I was reminded of one moment in particular where you're talking about how um, instead of taking just following the arrow and following um, a route, um, following a road that sort of takes you down a slope. You could just jump off the slope and save yourself like 15, 20 seconds. Um, so that's, that was another thing where even though um, crazy taxi is sort of static, as we've been talking about with um, memorizing kind of a linear route in a way, um, I feel like that, that, that aspect of learning the the world and knowing like kind of where different people are, where different routes are, how to mm-hmm. get from point A to point B is something that carried through into say a burnout paradise. Yeah, I yeah. agree with everything you said, except for one word. And that's, I would actually classify it as a nonlinear route. Mm. Meaning um, that if, if I you recognize that, yeah. where the nodes go, um, you know, I know that if I see a priest, he's going to want to go to church. I know that if I see uh, a dude with the funky hair, he's going to want to go to the record store. I know that the, uh, the girl in the tight jeans is always going to want to go to the original Levi's store. Mm-hmm. Of course. Uh, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, that it's, it's those kind of cues. Um, and, and, and sometimes they're not, it's not a hundred percent. I mean, it's not completely like that, but if I'm like contextually, I know that this girl goes there. So that's going to get me into that area that I want to be because I only have 90 seconds left and there's a, there's a huge park and a bunch of shorts and I can, I can make up the time that I've lost. I mean, you can actually think on the fly like that. Yeah. Um, once you have that much information. So I would say it is nonlinear. Mm. Yeah. Um, just, just as a point of interest. Um, so I did want to, as we're getting close to a close here, just briefly touch on the Crazy Taxi sequels. Maybe ignoring the ports, but look at the sequels. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how familiar uh, y'all may be with the sequels. I, but yeah, there, I had, were, there I had, were two, I had of two. Them. So there was Crazy Taxi 2 that was released for the Dreamcast. It's one of the very last games released on the Dreamcast. It's also the last it was game I ever bought. Well, um, for the Dreamcast? Mm-hmm. No, yeah. ever. Well, ever. <laughs> it, ever. it actually released the same month that, that the Dreamcast was discontinued in yep. 2001. And then there was actually a third Crazy Taxi game called Crazy Taxi 3 High Roller that released on the Xbox. Huh. I don't know if you ever played this one. I, had, I never even realized that existed. And I didn't either. I was looking up information about Crazy Taxi 2, um, which I had a vague memory of, and found Crazy Taxi 3. And I've never actually played it. So it looking at the reception, it wasn't... It was middle. It was like a above average, but not mm-hmm. great. So I don't know if that was a that was just because by 2002, maybe some of the um, design had gotten a little old, or if it was just not a well done version of the game. I, I guess I can't really say for sure. But I find it interesting that we had this period from 99 to 2002 where they were pumping out um, ports and sequels, and then it just stopped. Yep. Um, so kind of have one question. Um, that I'd sort of like to to talk about briefly, and that is for modern games that are that are coming out now and in the future. 
are there any lessons from Crazy Taxi design principles that maybe have been forgotten over time um, that were used, say, in GTA 3 Vice City and aren't even used now um, or were used in Burnout Paradise but aren't used now in that series that could, could apply to newer games? Everything is procedural nowadays hmm. and leaderboards don't matter. And so I would say oh, that's a good answer. Those, those two in tandem in tandem are a, an incredibly valuable experience that we just don't have, you know, curate instead of procedurally generate. Right. This is the lesson of Diablo right. three, by the way, yeah. everybody was like, eh, I don't know. Cause it didn't feel tight enough. Right. It, it, it just wasn't curated quite enough. And knowing we were too smart, knowing that something is procedurally generated can have the effect of ruining it for us. Mm-hmm. Um, yet, being in something like a roguelike, that actually is, can be a lot of fun because you, who you're competing against then is yourself. Can I get further than I did last time knowing that it's procedurally generated? That's a whole different experience. Right. That's completely unlike Crazy Taxi. And yet at the same time, I wonder if um, Crazy Taxi might have had an interesting twist to it. If, for example, you knew that spiky haired guy always wanted to go to the record store but where they placed spiky haired guy wasn't the same every time. Mm-hmm. And so if you saw him, you could be like, oh, I know where he's going. I want to get to that place um, or I know they can get there quickly. That sort of thing from where I am, as opposed to kind of finding that optimal route that you could potentially do. Sure. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's also an element of sort of adaptation where, um, you know, dear, like you said, thinking on the fly of based on your performance this time, like you, there are always complica- complications of like performing well enough. Yeah. I ran over a mailbox. Mm-hmm. Oops. And so. Like, because you're slower this time, you're going to change your plan a little bit to go with kind of this option A instead of option B, um, as opposed to like option B being like the thing you'd be doing if this was a perfect run, that sort of deal. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it did kind of strike me that um, I could see some incentive to playing Crazy Taxi over and over and over again in order to really learn it and to learn here's the best way to do it to try to beat my score. At the same time, I feel like. I would get bored of that if it was anything other than an arcade experience, which it was. Mm -hmm. And so to be fair, that was an experience that they were, they could go with because it works in that environment. That makes sense. But if it was a console game, I think I'd get really bored really quickly. Well, nowadays, sure. But you know, you got to think back to the good old days of 1997 when we were playing it on a console, we didn't really have the internet we have today. Mm -hmm. There was no Facebook. You know, it, it's not like we could. There was there was AOL chat boards. Well, that's so true, sir. That is so true. <laughs> uh, but my my point is simply this: it was a home arcade, mm-hmm. and that's the point. Uh, you were you were trying to bring home that arcade experience, and and similar to um, Street Fighter Two, although that was a two player two player game, but similar to, to people that bought say the Super Nintendo version of Street Fighter Two to play it, it wasn't just for. Um, oftentimes it wasn't just to play it at home with your friends to get better than them. It was for practice. So when you go to the arcade, you can really impress those around so you true. and win. So people that's that, really true. Right. And people that bought Crazy Taxi were thinking the same thing. Yeah, a lot of times true. they would play at home and try to get higher, higher, higher scores, higher routes. Then they would go to the arcade if they if they had one nearby that they could go to in order to show off, get high ranks. You know, maybe maybe they're going to get ranked number one at that particular arcade because they practiced at home. So it is, it is a very different mindset, like you're saying, Doc, yeah, than what yeah. we have now. That's true. But I agree. As a, as a modern game, I'm not sure it would do as well. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I, I think there's something to be said for it being a a mobile space game, if done right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I it think, hasn't been. And I have played some racers that are done really well on mobile, but yeah. they're built for mobile. They're not ports. Right. right. Ports yeah, are precisely, the ones yeah. Suffer, yeah. And to kind of answer my own question, too, with that, I think y'all gave really good answers as well. Um I don't I don't so much think that the game itself should necessarily be, you know, copied wholesale, but I, I love the concept of going from point A to point B and sort of it guiding you guiding you along without telling you where to go. Like you still have a choice. I could go pick up this person or this person or this person. And based on the the clues that the game is giving me, the cues, the visual cues, I know if I pick up this person, they're going to take me to this spot and it's going to be a, approximately this distance away. Mm-hmm. So you have an understanding of, of the game world and the space based on these visual cues. You have some agency, some choice in what you're doing, but at the same time, it is that curated experience that you were talking about, yeah. Doc. Yeah. It's not procedural. You are being led to an extent forward on that circuit that they have in the game, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's still your choice ultimately kind of in how you get there and what and 
the, the, the different sort of routes and paths that you might take are going to slightly vary based on your choices. So yeah. I, I think there's, there's some value there um, also in the concept of the replayability of trying to memorize what's the best way to go could be reused, maybe not necessarily just the, you know, on certain platforms, but I do feel that an arcadey experience can be and i know if i know if bash mobile games a lot but i do think that there's value in the mo in the mobile market for something like this um it's difficult i know in terms of racing maybe not maybe it's not racing or maybe it needs to be designed in a certain way like like chris you were saying for the mobile market but because mobile focuses so much on small experiences quick experiences and because crazy taxi as well as you memorize those routes you know, especially the first several times you play it, you're only going to be playing for a few minutes. And that really, I think, benefits the mobile platform much more so than a home console. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For today. Like, yeah. It, today's gamers. Oh, I'd love to see it. I mean, what's it called whenever you, uh, like, refurbish a car? You restore a car? Is that it? Yes. Okay, so we could have, like, Crazy Taxi Restored, right? <laughs> and But it's it's the old cars, and we've got new drivers and maybe some new cities and some new vibes and stuff, but could still be, like, the California vibe thing. Uh, or whatever. I always thought of it as Florida because I lived in Florida. Um, but you're, you're right. It's totally California. Um, and, and when I think about it, you know, there's so much of it that I think really was innovative. Uh, we didn't even talk about the destructible scenery really. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't talk how, uh, we didn't talk about how, uh, the, the cars themselves are all open top. Like they're all Convertibles. Convertibles. Yeah, but always with the top down. Yeah, yeah, so that no matter where you stop, you know, they can vault themselves into the car mm -hmm. easily, stuff like that. You could also see more easily how they're reacting to your driving. Like, they'll get, like, they'll sort of stand up yeah. almost and, like, start shouting at you yeah, if you're running out of true. time. That they, sort of deal. They do. That's a good point. I, I did want to point out briefly, because I did look it up, Crazy Taxi does take place in this sort of vague, vaguely defined West Coast. Right. So it was essentially California. But Crazy Taxi 2 took place in the small apple <laughs> so i bet you can guess where, uh -huh. where that is new york uh -huh. city yeah uh-huh yeah i really didn't play it that much um you know I, I boxed it up and moved and also got married um and so that'll do it right uh and then it was just one of those things years later i sold my console and and just didn't play that that second game much um well for those looking for another crazy taxi experience in 2007 for the psp crazy taxi Fair Wars was released. So apparently there was another game in the series that we hadn't even heard of that... What was console was that for? PSP, the PlayStation Portable. Crazy Taxi, quite the franchise, actually. Um, and I think it's I think it's an amazing license. And I, and I think it's really due for a, a grand rebirth in a good way. That would just be crazy. <clears throat> well, thank you for joining us, everyone, for the... <laughs> I, just, I feel like you need to insert like a crickets chirping yeah. sound effect after that. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us for this uh, first in our series on transitional games, uh, focusing this time on the legacy of Crazy Taxi. It's definitely going to be a cool series. We're going to keep doing um, not all in a row. Of course, a lot of our series will kind of uh, come back to it here and there. Uh, we haven't yet decided on what the uh, the next game is going to be, but we've definitely got a good um, list to pull from from uh these classic games that don't get uh talked about a lot recently it's funny too because um some people will define retro games as something about 15 years old and that's about where this is um so whether or not you want to call these retro is kind of a matter of um your personal viewpoint you are wrong if you if that's your viewpoint of retro some Just people say it out some people say 20 some people say 25 some people it's a little bit more um a little... back in my day we didn't have retro video games <laughs> It's probably true. Uh, <laughs> we called them books. <laughs> but we, we definitely have uh, some, some good stuff coming up, so look forward to that. You wanted to play a retro game, you played Ball in a Cup. My talk. <laughs> what, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. <laughs> I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.